This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only one, to the mysteries we will examine. Death Watch outside Trenton State Prison awaits the execution of Bruno Richard Hauptmann. He has been convicted of kidnapping and murdering this child, the firstborn son of Charles Lindbergh. On the night of April 3rd, 1936, Bruno Hauptmann is put to death. After years of intensive research, a writer named Anthony Scaduto has uncovered startling new evidence that Bruno Hauptmann may not have been guilty of the kidnap or murder of the Lindbergh baby. We are a nation founded in laws, but sometimes our system of justice doesn't live up to its highest ideals. With newly uncovered evidence, we're going to go back more than half a century and carefully re-examine a moment when justice may have faltered. New York is a city with a passion for hailing its heroes. And in 1927, it celebrates a man who with one courageous act has captured the imagination of the world. His name is Charles Lindbergh, and he has flown the Atlantic alone. The most famous man of his time Lindbergh shuns the public eye. As privately as is possible, he courts the beautiful Anne Morrow, daughter of an American ambassador. Soon the couple is married, and in 1930, their first child is born. It is a boy named Charles Augustus Lindbergh, Jr. As the son of a national hero, he is famous and adored, but his life is doomed. On March 1st, 1932, the Lindbergh home is secretly entered through the second floor nursery window. The sleeping Lindbergh baby is stolen from his crib. A makeshift wooden ladder was used to reach the child while the Lindberghs were on the floor below. Within hours, the Lindbergh house in Hopewell, New Jersey is crowded with police. A ransom note demands $50,000 for the baby's safe return. Posters describing the 20-month-old baby are quickly circulated throughout the country. New York and New Jersey police are assigned to double shifts in an all-out search for the child. In New York City, first contact is made with the kidnappers by a retired school teacher named John F. Condon. Condon becomes a go-between in the attempt to recover the child. The baby will be returned, I hope, in a short time. We are in contact and nobody is giving up. A month after the kidnapping, Condon and Charles Lindbergh deliver $50,000 to a cemetery in the Bronx. The ransom is accepted, but the Lindbergh baby is not returned. One month later, near the Lindbergh estate, the baby's body is found. For the next two and a half years, police and the FBI tried desperately to solve the crime. Marked bills from the ransom money are turning up throughout New York. In September of 1934, one of the ransom bills is spent at a gas station in Manhattan. The man who passed the bill is an immigrant German carpenter named Bruno Richard Hauptmann. Police search his house in the Bronx. In his garage, they find hidden nearly $15,000 of the Lindbergh ransom money. Hauptmann is arrested and taken to the Bronx County Courthouse. Amid a flurry of publicity, he's charged with murder. The long and frustrating search for the kidnapper of Lindbergh's child is finally over. Though the evidence against Hauptmann is totally circumstantial, authorities feel certain they've found their man. Hauptmann is arraigned in New York and extradited to New Jersey for trial. Flemington, New Jersey is a small and quiet town. 
But on January 2nd, 1935, its normally tranquil courthouse becomes the focus of world attention. Thousands flock to what newspapers call the most sensational trial of the century. Though he hates the publicity, Lindbergh attends on every single day. David Willens heads the prosecution. The noted criminal lawyer, Edward J. Riley, is in charge of Hauptmann's defense. All counsel are prepared. We do not anticipate any adjournments, and we are ready to go. Since the time of his arrest, Hauptmann has claimed to be totally innocent of the charges against him. Now, he must defend himself before a vengeful public and a sensation-seeking press. For Hauptmann's wife, the trial is torture. Judge Thomas Trenchard has allowed cameras in the courtroom so that the world can witness the trial. The ladder used to reach the baby becomes the trial symbol and a major piece of evidence. An expert claims that it was partly constructed with wood from Hauptmann's attic. A panel of handwriting experts testify that Hauptmann's writing is identical to that in the ransom notes. Initially, Hauptmann seems unperturbed. Now, John F. Condon takes the stand. He tells the court that he handed the Lindbergh ransom money to a tall, thin man with a German accent at a cemetery in the Bronx. The man called himself John. Who is John? John is Bruno Richard Hoffman. Now, Charles Lindbergh tells the court that it was Hauptmann's voice that he clearly heard on the night that the ransom was paid. Another witness, Amandus Hochmuth, swears he saw Hauptmann near the Lindbergh house on the day before the crime. A host of other eyewitnesses connect Bruno Hauptmann with the ransom money. Uh, Hauptmann drove into my station and filled up to an apple pump and asked for five gallons of gas. I identified Bruno Richard Hauptmann. I identified Bruno Richard Hauptmann. Bruno as Richard Hauptmann was the man who came to the Sheraton Theater and handed me one of the five dollar ransom bills. Now, Hauptmann's only real defense lies in his power to convince the court that he did not commit the crime. When he finally takes the stand, his denials are not persuasive. Didn't you lie on the road? For time and time again, did you? I did not. You did not? No. All right. When you were arrested with this Lindbergh ransom money, you had a $20 bill. Lindbergh ransom money, did they ask you to worry about it? Did they ask you? They did. Did you lie to them or did you tell them the truth? Did you lie to them or did you tell them the truth? The trial of Bruno Hauptmann lasts for 31 days. The jury reaches its verdict in little more than 11 hours. As the news of Hauptmann's conviction is flashed around the world, his wife and his attorney make a final public appearance. Mrs. Hauptmann. You still believe in the innocence of your husband, don't you? I believe. And I know my husband is innocent. He did not kidnap the Lindbergh baby. And he did not murder the Lindbergh baby. I wish to appeal to the people of the United States to help me. I have no money. I haven't even got money for my sick baby. At New Jersey's Trenton State Prison, Hauptmann waits to die. On April 3rd, 1936, the sentence is carried out. Newsreel cameras at the time recreate Hauptmann's last moments. To the end, he will say he is innocent. Flash, United Press, Trenton. Hoffman executed, 8, 47 and one half. A morbid crowd outside the prison has gathered to watch the hearse leave. 
In New York City, nearly 40 years after Hauptmann's death, new evidence has come to light. Anthony Scaduto, a writer and a former reporter, has spent more than three years investigating the complex details of the Lindbergh kidnapping case. Scaduto's probing research has revealed some startling new facts. Back in 1973, I got a call from a man who had been on the fringes of organized crime for many years. I, I had been the mafia expert, so-called, for the New York Post. And he said he could prove that Hauptmann was absolutely innocent uh, of the crime of kidnapping and killing the Lindbergh baby. And I began to check into some of his evidence, and I eventually got into the files of the Bronx District Attorney's Office and the New York City Police Department. And I found strong evidence that Hauptmann indeed had been the victim of a frame-up. I found evidence that all the eyewitness testimony had been, the eyewitnesses were either liars or uh, mistaken, that the expert testimony, the expert witnesses, distorted in order to help convict Hauptmann, and that the physical evidence, every piece of physical evidence, was either manufactured by the police or distorted by them to convict Hauptmann. And I feel absolutely certain that Hauptmann was innocent. Was Bruno Richard Hauptmann deliberately sent to his death? The old Lindbergh house in Hopewell, New Jersey is today a state home for juvenile delinquents. The corner of the second floor was once the Lindbergh's nursery. The kidnapper entered through this window to reach the sleeping baby. The baby was then carried down this shaky wooden ladder. But did Bruno Hauptmann build it? and then steal the Lindbergh child? You never took your children into that bedroom, did you? I never was. You never took that ladder up there either, did you? You didn't build it. You didn't take that ladder out of your attic either, did you? No, sir. One of the major pieces of physical evidence against Hauptmann was the ladder. The police and prosecution claimed that Hauptmann climbed into his attic, cut a piece of floorboard out of the attic, went back down to his apartment, two floors down, back to his garage, in which there was a great deal of lumber, uh, to use this piece of wood to construct the ladder. And a expert witness testified that the grains of wood from the remaining piece in the attic floor matched precisely the rail of the ladder that they claimed Hauptmann took out of the attic. The fact is, you could see very clearly when you put the two pieces together that in order to make the grains match, one has to shove one of the pieces up higher in a very unnatural, distorted position. Based on this and other evidence, Scaduto believes that the wood in the ladder may have been tampered with while in the possession of the police. The ladder, however, is only a part of the evidence that Scaduto uncovered. The woods about a mile from the Lindbergh house is the site where the baby's body was found. It was quickly buried in a shallow grave. Scaduto discovered evidence that the body was not the missing child. The body that was found was in such a severe state of decomposition that the family doctor on looking at the corpse said, if you gave me a million dollars, I could not identify this thing. Lindbergh made the identification solely on the basis of counting the number of teeth. Uh, any child of the same age generally, millions of children of the same age, would have the same number of teeth. The chances are that that body was not the body of the Lindbergh baby, which means that no murder has been proved, which means that Hauptmann was absolutely wrongly convicted, forgetting all the other evidence. He was wrongly convicted because they could not prove a murder. When police discovered ransom money hidden in Hauptmann's garage, Hauptmann claimed that the cash belonged to a man named Isidore Fish. Fish, he said, was a business partner who had gone to Europe and then died. Hauptmann insisted he discovered the cash in a box Fish had left for safekeeping. The explanation seemed far-fetched and was dubbed the Fishy story. I found in the files of the district attorney's office and the New York City Police Department that evidence to show that Hauptmann and Fish indeed were business partners evidence that was suppressed to destroy Hauptmann's alibi, 
uh, to create this fishy story that Hauptmann was telling. Uh, also, uh, evidence that Hauptmann and Fish did not meet until four or five, three, four months after the kidnapping, so that there was no possibility that they had been partners even in the kidnapping and seizing of the ransom. All of this was suppressed in order to destroy Hauptmann's alibis. Handwriting played an important role in the conviction of Bruno Hauptmann. The prosecution's chief handwriting expert was Albert Osborne. The physical evidence connecting the writing of all of the Lindbergh ransom notes and the writing signed Hauptmann is, in my opinion, irresistible, unanswerable, and overwhelming. Scaduto learned that the handwriting comparisons were made largely on the basis of numerous forced dictations taken from Hauptmann at police headquarters. Hauptmann's written numbers could never be shown to match those on the ransom notes. And there is evidence of tampering. In 1977, I was contacted by a woman named Hilda Zenglein. She was a defense handwriting expert. She was dismissed because she said that she would get up and testify that the original ransom notes had been tampered with to make them look more like Hauptmann's handwriting. And she sent me a, an example of what she saw. And what they basically did, she said, was to round off letters in the ransom notes so they would look more like Hauptmann's handwriting. She said it was very obvious. And she was not permitted to testify. That evidence was never introduced by the defense. During the trial, many witnesses did take the stand to testify against Hauptmann. Amanda's Hawkmuth pointed to Hauptmann as the man he saw driving near the Lindbergh house on the day before the kidnapping. I found documents to show that about two months after this event, Amanda's Hawkmuth applied for welfare in New York City, and it was granted because the welfare agent said, quote, he is almost totally blind, close quote. He could not have identified anyone. John F. Condon played a major role in the conviction of Bruno Hauptmann. Dr. Condon was a garrulous old man who very, very honestly wanted to help recover the Lindbergh child. And he injected himself into the case and was accepted as an intermediary. When Hauptmann was arrested, Condon was asked to identify him to see whether Hauptmann was the man to whom Condon had passed the ransom money. After looking at Hauptmann and even talking with him and shaking his hand, uh, Condon stepped out of the identification room and told police and the FBI agents that he could not identify this man. He said, this is not the man. Condon would not identify Hauptmann until two or three weeks before the trial. In the interim, he had been coerced by the police. One, he was threatened with violence. And two, he was threatened with arrest as an accomplice if he would not identify Hauptmann. Hauptmann was also identified by Charles Lindbergh himself. In the atmosphere of the trial, the testimony was damning. Lindbergh identified Hauptmann's voice as the voice he heard in the cemetery almost two and a half years before, speaking only two words, hey doctor. And that identification cinched it in the jury's mind at the very early stages. The juries later told reporters that when they heard Lindbergh say that it was Hauptmann's voice that spoke those words the night the ransom was passed, they were convinced Hauptmann was guilty. The thing is that Lindbergh, uh, after Hauptmann's arrest, heard Hauptmann speak those words again in the Bronx District Attorney's office, and for a full week he could not make up his mind. Not until the police had relayed to him all the evidence that they had compiled against Hauptmann much of which I've later found has been tampered with, manufactured. All that evidence was given to Lindbergh as the reason that Hauptmann was indeed the kidnapper. And only after that did Lindbergh say, right, I'll identify his voice. And he did at the trial. Was Bruno Hauptmann really guilty of the kidnap and murder of the Lindbergh child? For Anthony Scaduto, the answer is clear. At best, uh, Hauptmann's role, and I feel this strongly, was that he had no connection in any way with the kidnapping nor with the extortion. That his greatest part in it was to have taken the box full of money 
from Isidore Fish, not knowing it was money, not discovering it was money until months after he learned Fish had died in Germany. At worst, he could have been the receiver of stolen goods. That is, he could have known that this box actually contained money and that it contained hot money. I think what happened is once they found Hauptmann in possession of the $15,000 in ransom money, they believed firmly that he was the guilty party. Individually, police officers distorted evidence, even manufactured evidence, and suppressed evidence that would have proved his innocence because they were so firmly convinced he was guilty. And they sent him to the electric chair. If the Lindbergh baby was not the victim of Bruno Richard Hauptmann, who then kidnapped the child? Without any real conclusive evidence, because I have not been able to get into the files of the New Jersey State Police, uh, I feel rather strongly that Isidore Fish had some role in it, perhaps as the kidnapper, perhaps simply as the extortionist. And it could have been two different plots. But Isidore Fish had been a swindler. He was involved with underworld figures, and he had seen in the area of the Lindbergh home weeks, days, months perhaps before the kidnapping. Also that Isidore Fish was known to have had uh, business dealings and personal friends in the area of the Lindbergh home in the Sauerland Mountains. In conclusion, I feel strongly that Isidore Fish, if anyone, had a large hand in the kidnapping and or extortion. He was perhaps the most controversial explorer in Egyptian history. An ex-circus star goes digging Friday on Ancient Mysteries. Now, they were symbols of pride, but did they serve another purpose? Danny Glover unfurls the Union and Confederate flags on Civil War Journal, next on a, &A. It's time well spent.